All right, let's see if we could move this thing from here. This always does a real number on me. Huh? Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, got it. Let me do this again. Okay, are you seeing my screen there, guys? Yes. Okay, let me, this thing is in the middle of my screen, which I hate. So let me move that from there and um, go again. Okay, this was my last thing, so let's get into this. So, <laughs> good to be here again. Let me kind of get right into this. Um, I just said this a while ago um, before we started recording, but I'm going to say it again. This is recommended reading. I strongly recommend that every one of you get a copy of Charles O'Pierre's book. It's called Un Unmasking Mama. And um, Charles takes us all the way back to Genesis and really exposes this whole issue of mammon. Very, very good concepts inside of there. I don't want to kind of say anything about it now. Whenever you get your copy and you've read it yourself, and when we engage Charles and Susan, I have um, a couple questions that I want to ask them because um, I really found that the way in which he approached the topic was quite, quite, quite um. Quite good, very, very good. Um, the writing style is one where we could all read and all capture it and fully understand and fully embody. So get a copy. Don't ask somebody to lend, lend you um, their copy. Don't try to get a PDF file online and try to see if you could kind of get, um, find a way around circumventing buying the book. Buy, buy the book <laughs> and let's contribute towards the discussion, all right? So that's the first thing I want to say. The second piece of announcement is this is a save the date. A save the date. You need to, um, I'm sure you know about this already, but I want to bring it to your attention again. Uh, this is a one day Nation Builders Summit. It's happening on September the 24th. Save the date, write it down, grab a hold of that, uh, go and register. Right there, you could see you could join the conference by registering at nationbuilders.vision. Uh, you need to be a part of this. Not only you need to be a part of this, I want to encourage you all to take <coughs> the take this particular screen and all the other information that I'm sure you've been getting and post it on your Facebook page. Anybody that you believe could get value from this one day, this one day summit, please point them to this. It's happening from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. British Standard Time. And so you need to synchronize that with your time zone so that you could be a part of this important conversation. Um, as we've said before, uh, this particular meeting, this summit will not be what I what what in the 19th century they used to call them um, city criers. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with city criers in the 19th century when Europe was fairly unintelligent and um, they were not a very um, uh, academic society. It had these city criers, individuals that would come and scream out the news so everybody could hear it. Uh, people were not involved. They were not the type who would kind of ask questions. A city crier just came and announced the information and he walked away. And this is not a city crying kind of meeting. This would be very interactive. Uh, a lot of questions, a lot of feedback, a lot of back and forth. And so you need to register for this and register early. I don't know if Frederick is on the line. If Frederick is on the call, Fred, are you there? Is Frederick on the call? If Hi, Anderson. I'm on the call. Okay, Fred. Um, you want to add anything to to this kind of um kind of boost what I've just said? Anything that I must have missed? Anything that you need to add? Um, um, no, I mean, I think. Yeah, I think I think in terms of on the day, we're going to be covering what is essentially the bare essentials, um, which is about the future of our communities, education, governance and economies. Um, so join us on the 24th, 24th of June. Um, I think it's going to be a really important conversation. Um, and yeah, as, as you've already said, share as much as possible. Um, it's the first event. We're hoping to do this every year. It won't always be online. I think sometimes we're going to try to achieve it by, by you know, uh, uh, by turning up. But um, for this one, it will be online. And I think it just, it, it it's a natural fit in what we're discussing in the Global Kingdom conversation. Beautiful, beautiful. And you see, most of you are familiar with all the guys here. The only person that you may not be familiar with on this call is Polini, who happens to be... Um, a partner to Frederick and Frederick and Polemi actually are hosting this particular meeting. 
And so um, the rest are what we would call the usual suspects. So um, jump on this call, register, make it available to your friends, your family, colleagues, and anyone whom you believe will be able to get some value from this. So having said that, let's get into today's conversation. Let's get down here and let's get into today's conversation. We've been talking for a while <laughs> on the whole issue of um, on the whole issue of sonship and adoption, and I want to continue right there. I don't know how much of what I want to cover we'll cover today, but as always, we want to make this fairly interactive and get your feedback. So we are dealing today with um, adoption and the heart of the father. If we could only get down to that yellow part, the heart of the father then I would say we've covered a significant amount of ground today. In getting to the heart of the Father, I want to go back to the book of Genesis, and then I want to swing back and spend more time around the prodigal son story. So, so um, let's hope we can make, that, make this entire trek and get all of these things we've done before the end of the day. So let me tee up this conversation and tell you how we're going to do this today. There are several things I want to get. Get done. <laughs> Number one, I want to at least um, throw a truism. A truism is a, a statement of undeniable truth. And so I want to throw up a truism, first of all, and maybe you can ruminate over it, think about it, uh, hold it in the back of your heart and mind, and uh, and and uh, maybe you could share it as well. So we're going to show, show up a truism and not talk long around, around it. Let's maybe mention one or two points concerning that. Secondly, I want to take a very succinct scan of the term adoption. Let's go back and look at it. Some of it I said already, but I think it's important for me to kind of um, look at some additional concepts, but not too detailed. A very succinct scan of the term adoption. The third thing, I want to contextualize the metaphor, the adoption metaphor. Let's go back and look at the four areas. Paul was the one who introduced the concept of adoption to the New Testament. The vocabulary of adoption is a Paul thing. Nobody else communicated that particular concept. And so what I want to do is to look at three of the four areas where Paul spoke of adoption and pick out some concepts and let those concepts give us almost like a broad view, a panoramic view of some of the nuanced areas that are buried inside of the issue of adoption. So that's the third thing we'll be contextualizing the adoption metaphor. Number four, I want to kind of walk through five principles that relate to the term Abba, because once you are adopted, you are, your language change, your vocabulary, your interaction, the nature of your relationship with God changes. He's no longer a master and a ruler. He's no longer your boss. You now have the freedom, the right, the power to refer to him as Abba. And what is this concept of Abba? How does this affect the way you pray, the way you engage God? How does this <laughs> influence the areas of your boldness and your confidence? Let's talk about Abba. And number five, uh, we're going to talk about the heart of the father and look at the prodigal. And so um, I don't think we'll get to number five. If we don't get there, we'll just leave this for another time. So let's get into this and let's look at <laughs> a little truism. Um, every now and again, I kind of, um, I used to do this quite regularly, just post a tweet. I've not posted a tweet in about two to three years, but um, I got up this morning and I was just kind of, uh, not this morning, a couple of days ago, I'm pushing some stuff out. Uh, and I, I wrote this down and I want to share it with you just for you to hold it in your heart and mind. And this is a simple but incredibly profound concept. A self-indulgent, manichaean, colonized, self-righteous, divided and obsessively religious church will always fail in its effort to project a moral imperative on the world. Now that's a, that is a very, very, very intense comment. Let me explain a couple of things inside of there. First is the word self-indulgent. A self-indulgent church <laughs> is a church that is consumed with enriching itself. And so much of what passes for Christianity in 2023 uh, has this perspective where God is like a sugar daddy or where God is like a Santa Claus. And we try to push God up in a corner 
to satisfy our every need. Even the idea of faith is like some tool that we utilize in order to enrich ourselves. And faith was never intended to be a tool that satisfies our every desire. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is not a mechanism to get healing, to get blessing, to get favor, to get money. That's a self-indulgent church. A Manichaean church, the word Manichaean is a word that basically means uh, given to double standards and duplicity, unclear of its identity and kind of lost in a world of schizophrenia. We believe one thing, yet we practice another. We have a very religious posture on a Sunday morning, and then we kind of uh, develop this kind of alter ego by, by Saturday night. And we have this kind of weird disposition where we are not taking the kingdom along a smooth, uneven, un a smooth path all the way into all dimensions of life. That's Manichaean. A colonized church is a church that has been, a, that almost like, it's a church that has been hijacked by pseudo apostles, hijacked by missionaries, hijacked by religion, hijacked by denominationalism, and so much of its values have been skewed by one of the apostles masquerading as God agents and skewed by missionary values that superimposed itself upon our societies. That's a colonized church where your identity, your, your whole perspective is marred and dysfunctional. And so we need to have a church in the earth that will liberate itself from the current systems that seek to imperialize it. Self-righteous is basically a church that is obsessed with its own deluded perspective of its purity. And so much of us think that, well, we are all that simply because we don't do certain things. And so there, there's a large cross-section of the church that may say, well, I may not be immoral, but they have no integrity. And, and so they think that because their morals are all well and good, they are almost like allowed to be short on areas of integrity. They, 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 are, they don't show regard and love and care for the brothers. Uh, and so when we talk about a self-righteous church, we are dealing with a church that lives inside of the orbit of us versus them. We are clean and they are not. Divided doesn't need much, much, um, much definition. And obsessively religious doesn't need that either. The point is, once a church is characterized by these particular adjectives, it's fairly obvious that this church would fail in its effort to project a moral imperative on the world. And um, we do have a responsibility, but for some odd reason, <coughs> who we are is betraying what we ought to be and what we ought to do. Who we currently present ourselves to be, and the current uh, caricatured version of what we have as a church is completely uh, destroying the authority with which we are to truly bring the earth to a place of repentance before God. So this is the one truism I wanted to throw at you, is self-indulgent, Manichaean, colonized, self-righteous, divided, and obsessively religious church will always fail in its effort to project a moral imperative on the earth. <laughs> now, let's get into adoption, a very succinct view. Some of these things we said before, but I want you to follow me. <laughs> and uh, in following me, I want to kind of um, rehearse some things, but expand on some other. Let's talk some more about this issue of adoption. Galatians chapter 4. Now, I say that the heir, <laughs> as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. As long as the heir is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Observe the emphasis, does not differ at all. And it, it almost tends to suggest that while you are an heir, but you're an immature heir, there is little room between you and a slave. That emphasis they, it, they does not differ at all. That's a very strong emphasis. It does not say, well, you're an heir and there's this big gap between you and the slave. Does not differ at all from a slave, though he's the master of all. But he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, 
When we were children, we were in bondage over the, under the elements of the world. <laughs> but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son. Someone needs to kind of admit um, um, Garnet into the meeting. Um, can um, uh, Kevin, can you admit because he would he's, be- He's joining. He just uh, okay. having some trouble with the audio probably. Okay, cool. So verse five, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of son. That would receive as an important word. And because you are sons, God has sent this, sent forth the spirit of his son in your heart, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. And um, I put there on the screen that, that Greek word for adoption, a word that Paul introduced us to. Let me um, identify some very important principles. Now, when Paul started introducing this whole image of adoption to the New Testament. Uh, Paul used a word that is very, very unique. And the thing is, there were other words available to Paul in those days when he brought this word. Um, you have to understand that Paul was a Roman citizen. And so he was very familiar with some of the Roman cultures. He understood the systems, the dogmas, the rules, the politics of Rome. And so Paul here is borrowing a concept from Rome. But there were other words. Example, there was a word called adoptio. That was a word that was available at the time to describe adoption. And this was a level of adoption that was practiced by the legally dependent. When I say legally dependent, assuming that you are living in your parents' house and you are an adult in your parents' house, but you want to adopt someone who could more or less be like maybe your maid, your personal slave, some attendant or something of the sort, then you had the right to go and engage in adoption. And the word that you would use or the one that would be, the word that would be, that would describe your action is this, this word, adopt you. But then there was another word. And the word was uh, adjocatio. Adjocatio was another word available at the time. And this was another term used to describe adoption, which was practiced by the legally independent. So you are no longer in your parents' house. You are, you are now living on your own and you are independent. Maybe you recently got married or so, and you may have some medical conditions and you may not be able by your medical condition to have a child of your own. And so you had a space where you could have gone and adopted a child. Adjocatio, gatio, was a word that was associated with your situation. And then outside of that, it just had what was known as the de facto adoption. De facto adoption would be those who uh, adopted someone outside of the ambit of the law or what was considered common law at the time. And it's interesting that <coughs> All of these practices were available to Paul. And so when Paul introduced the New Testament to adoption, he bypassed these terms. He bypassed the, the de facto adoption. He bypassed the adrogatio, and he bypassed the adaptio. And he introduced us to a word that was completely different altogether. These three words were normally used by the common everyday citizen in Rome. However, there was a fourth word, and that's the word that we started looking at. And the word is huyothesia, huyothesia. I keep rolling that word over my tongue trying to get it right, huyothesia. And that's the word that Paul used to, to, to give us a sight into a different dimension of what this adoption is. Now, this was a word that was used, it was reserved only for the Roman elite and emperors where it was a normal practice for emperors to adopt heirs in situations where they had no sons of their own. Now, I find it interesting, and I'm sure that you, who being a student of the Word of God and who understands the structure of Revelation, you could understand how deliberate Paul was in trying to bring us into this particular space. Because when he's trying to 
bring us into an understanding as, as, to, as to what adoption is, he takes us to the very top and he's saying basically like, listen, what we are coming into in God is not some low level, puerile kind of behavior. We are not kind of um, getting an opportunity to kind of uh, clean our snotty nose or change our little, our little tacky dress code. This is like we are stepping up and stepping up in a major, major way. So this word that was introduced by Paul for adoption, heliothesia, was a word used only. It was reserved only for the Roman elite. This was not a word that was used among everyday citizens. Among the Roman elites, this word heliothesia was such a normal practice that history has shown that only a handful of emperors were related by blood. This was such a normal practice among emperors. Let me give you an example. Most of us may be familiar with Titus and Domitian, those of you who get into the book of Revelations and you see how Jesus is dressed. Domitian was a ruthless character. He was a ruthless, ruthless emperor. And he would have brought all kinds of believers to the sword. He was a ruthless guy. But in the days when John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus was dressed very much the way Domitian himself was clad. So Titus and Domitian were the son of, of, of Vespasian, while Commodus was the son of Marcus Aurelius. Now, all the others, all the others, once you get to, to, to Tiberius and Nero and Trajan and Hadrian and Antoninus and, and Marcus Aurelius, all of them were adopted, all of them. The reason why I put that one little point inside of it, just to underscore that this was a normal practice among the elites, among the Caesars in Rome. And so Paul pulled that concept right out of the Roman political arena to describe something that was very normal inside of Rome, that you could bring someone into your orbit of dominance, into your orbit of political power, into your orbit of succession, into your orbit, into your orbit of leadership. And this was a normal practice. And he's giving us a window into some of the dynamic issues associated with, with God adopting us into his family. This word, Puyophysia, was, um, was an amalgam of two words. I think we said this before. This is an amalgam of two words. The word Puyos was a was a word in Greek culture that basically spoke to uh, more than just having a descendant. Now we're gonna see this word as we go forward, particularly when we look at the prodigal son, because this word is a very, very interesting word. This word means more than just having a child. I think Frederick walked us through a series of teachings before where he used all of the developmental processes to describe sonship from just basically a little child all the way up to responsibility. This word huius is a word that was used to describe a, most, a mature son. But more than meaning a mature son, this word also meant an apprentice, a disciple, a true subject, and a noble citizen. It was an interesting word among the Romans and among the Greeks because it was speaking more into someone of stature, someone of nobility, someone with responsibility, someone who is no longer an, an underdeveloped kind of puerile individual running around the streets of Jerusalem or Rome or wherever you might be. He's describing a sense of nobility. The other word that, point, that formed this word, who you fear, was the word tefimi. And the word tefimi means to position, to set, to assign, or to install. Both of the, these words going together basically describes sonship, not just as a uh, a nice little status concept, but it's like an office, a calling into which one was installed. And so in the New Testament, this concept of adoption, this word sonship, this word huyothesia, assign the adopted into a position of privilege and responsibility that is normally reserved for and associated with a legitimate firstborn. 
So when you are experiencing this whole process of who you're to see, you are not just kind of being picked up like any native, like any little average citizen in Rome. You are stepping into legitimate firstborn status. You are stepping into a place of elite privilege, into a place of elite responsibility. This is not some simple little issue. Who you to see is best described as sonship. Because the way Paul uses the word, there are no legal overtones. The word does not, though it has issues of legality, the very concept of the word huyothesia, it does not bring about. At first mention, it is not a strong legal concept, but it carries the idea of an attitude of the mind and the yieldedness of the heart. And that's the key thing. The issue here is not what document you signed is not how much not not how much somebody paid for in order to get you out of your bondage but at the core of this was an attitude of the heart and an attitude of the mind and the point here is that most of us could be redeemed by the blood most of us could be deep inside of the family of god but for some reason the attitude of the mind still leans towards servitude it still leans towards bondage it still leans towards uh being sycophantic in following some abstract individual but at the core of who you see was the issue not of legality but more so of the attitude the bending of the heart and the yieldedness of your spirit and not the legal inheritance and that's an important principle that i want to stress and i mentioned it in one of our previous sessions now let's go further now adoption is the legal device adoption this who you see is the legal device found in the Roman legal system by which a person leaves his own family and enters into the family of another. But remember that this was a word that was designated only for the elite status. So this is one where you, you walked away all of whatever you had, whatever you must have possessed, your image, your status, your identity. This is a word that speaks to massive and overwhelming status change. And we'll talk more about that going forward. When we speak of adoption, we are describing the legal device, the legal systems found in the Roman legal order by which a person leaves his own family. And leaving your own family speaks of abandoning status, whether you were high up or whether you were low down, whether you were a person of enormous stature in your former station, or whether you were a person who was who, were, who would be no more than a, than a, than a, a, a water carrier and woodcutter. No matter what status you had, Adoption canceled your previous status and brought you into another state of existence. Now, the primary reason, and we did mention some of this in our previous session, the primary reason for adoption was to ensure that the family making the adoption would continue. This had very little to do with you. And I know for us in the New Testament, because of that self-indulgent disposition, we see adoption only from the perspective of what we get, the status we get, the new name that we have, the potential to be heir. But at the core of the adoption system inside of the Roman structure, the primary reason was to ensure that the family making the adoption will continue their name, their objective, their purpose, their pursuit would continue. Now, please understand that while I'm talking about, about Roman parallels, I am not speaking about Roman issues here. We're talking about God. God brought us into a family. God adopted me, a worthless, pitiful little Trinidadian, brought me into his family. And what I get inside of that experience is not just a change of status and a brand new name. What I get is the opportunity to take God's purpose forward and to guarantee that his every intent uh, has a sense of sustainability and longevity, that it does not die with me. And that's why we are here, that God has an objective that must continue. And so he brings us into his family and he adopted us into his family so that his intentions will continue. Legacy is, is, is the basis of adoption. This is the core principle, legacy, 
continuance. It is never, it was never intended for the adoptee's status. It was never intended for the adoptee's protection, benefits and maintenance. This has little to do with you. And as I said in the last presentation on this, the moment that comes crystal clear in your mind, we switch on a new dynamic in the kingdom right there. The moment we no longer see this in the context of how much I get and the new status that I assume, and we suddenly realize that God brought us into his family to give longevity and legacy to his objective, that changes the way we interface with all of the mechanisms of eternity. It changes that dynamically. And God, I mean, God knows if that only takes on, if that only switches on inside of the consciousness of the average believer, we could really see a revolution the way God has ordained it. Now, ad adoption is a succession mechanism, succession mechanism, and it is intended to put a break on the distortion, deterioration, and extinction of the father's interest. Now, that's another loaded statement right there. But what God is after, as I said, is continuance. What he's after is succession. And succession there is not just, well, you now becoming the emperor when the former emperor died, or you becoming the Caesar when the former Caesar dies. We are just using the parallel that Paul gave us. But the objective is God is after the continuation of his objective. And a adoption was intended to put a break, to cancel out the distortion the deterioration and the extinction of the father's interest. Now, look at the church across the earth right now. And you realize the importance of these presentation and adoption. I did say to you in one of our first presentation why we are looking at this. God used adoption as a significant pillar to guarantee and to safeguard the entire global church from from slipping downhill into a world of massive distortion, deterioration, and the extinction or the abortion of his intentions. We are here not to celebrate the fact that, well, okay, we are children of God. That does not say much until <clears throat> we turn that dial and begin to respond to our responsibility from a brand new perspective. Adoption is a succession mechanism intended to put a break on the distortion, deterioration, and extinction or abortion of God's, the Father's interest. And that I really would like to settle in your heart because we are not on this call just to impress people with knowledge. We are not on this call just to kind of build a network. I have no interest in building a network. The wind has already moved beyond that sail. If you are still concerned about building networks, then listen, you are trying to build a passe model. And maybe you might not use the word networks. You could throw all kind of nice little terms inside of there, but that model is gone. That ice cube has melted. What we are here to do is to broadcast the message and try to switch on a revolution. And so if you are listening to this, I don't care which church you came from. I don't care which network you're a part of. I don't care who is your apostle and who you submit to. I don't care how sycophantic you are and whose uh, Kool-Aid you are constantly guzzling and drinking. I don't care. What I want is to light a spark inside of you that would literally force you to begin to see the purpose of God from a brand new perspective and a brand new light. And that's, that's what adoption seeks to produce. Now, listen to me. Adoption is the quintessential freedom, quintessential freedom for which we long and for which we are redeemed. Now, that's a very important point to write down because most of us assume that the whole process of redemption ended when you walk to the front of a church and repeat a sinner's prayer. I really don't know where we got that practice from, but we assume that the moment we walk to the front of a building and rehearse a prayer that a man told us to repeat, that the whole process is now completed. And from that point forward, all we have to do <laughs> is more or less kind of jump on the hamster wheel Sunday after Sunday. And that is your definition of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And the very model that we utilize, it cancels out the objective that God is after. 
adoption. And if we understand what this thing is, this is the quintessential. It is the most important. This is the zenith, the apogee of freedom for which all of us long for. And this is the reason for which we were redeemed. God wants to bring us into a place of absolute liberty, but liberty is not like singing whoopie doo on your hands in the air. That represents a world of enormous responsibility. Please write it down. Adoption is the quintessential freedom for which we long and for which we are redeemed. Adoption, very important, is the termination of estrangement, that sense of disconnection, that sense of not belonging. And you see, again, Christianity fooled us into believing that estrangement is no more the moment we walk to the front and rehearse the prayer. But, but you could be saved and in church, connected to some organization, but you are so far removed from God. Think about the people of Israel. They were the people of God. They were gods, almost like collective son. But as much as they were his sons, even Jesus said he came to his own and his own received him not. There was still that sense of estrangement. Adoption is the termination of estrangement. And so if this process really anchors itself within your own heart and within your consciousness, something inside of you gives you a sense of, ah, I belong. I'm in a family. I'm a part of a family. These words we use so flippantly and casually in all of our organizations, but do we understand the depth of the meaning that when God brought us into a family, he didn't bring us into a denomination? Didn't bring us into some little, some little imperialistic order where some pseudo apostle manipulating you and you have been reduced to nothing more than some blind loyalist. That is not a family. That's bondage. Adoption is the termination of estrangement, and it is the experience. Listen, it is the experience of status change, liberation, empowerment, inclusion, and equality. Now, those are important words. Because those of you who are familiar <laughs> with, with, with um, the efforts over the years, particularly in America, to bring, the, the, to bring other races and other people into a sense of equality, you understand the pushback that most of these people got from the system. The system had no problem in liberating you from slavery, but it had a problem in empowering you. So you could be liberated, but not empowered. The system had no problem in liberating you, saying, well, there's no more slavery, but it will never include you. You still had to have a white area and a black area. There were still things that, that there were still areas you could not go. It still had redlining, all that stuff. In other words, you are free, but you're not included. More than that, the system may say, we will liberate you. You're free, no more chains, but we would not see you as an equal. You would not be perceived as an equal. But in the kingdom, adoption is the termination of estrangement. Not only is it the termination of estrangement, but it is the experience. Experience in that regard is not a one-off thing. This has become your life, your normal, your everyday, everyday, all the time experience. It is the experience of status change that you're no longer some black insignificant or white insignificant or colored insignificant or Indian insignificant, but you have now experienced a status change by virtue of God bringing you and adopting you into his family. It is the experience of liberation, empowerment, inclusion, and equality. Those are very important words. So this is not a casual thing that God is doing to bring us into this experience. Now, the more we understand the, the dynamics of this, then we can say this very safely. The kingdom walk is a lifelong journey of interfacing with, fully imbibing, living from and reflexively applying the variegated or kaleidoscopic or multifaceted freedoms we have been given as the adopted. Now that there is a, is a loaded comment as well. <laughs> that the walk of salvation, the kingdom life, and what we do as we gather in platforms like these and we go to symposiums and summits like the one we are having on the 24th of, of, Jul of, Ju of, uh, of June, 
things that we interface with. When you sit in your meetings, you go to church, whatever you do, it is not intended for you to become some loyalist to some man. The kingdom work is a lifelong journey of interfacing with, engaging constantly with. It is intended for you to fully imbibe, make that a part of your literal DNA. It seeks to make you live from, this is the umbrella, this is your shelter, this is your true covering, and it is designed for you to reflexively apply, meaning without thinking, you begin to express the multi-dimensional freedoms that adoption brought you into. That's what the walk of the kingdom is all about. And if you were to <laughs> take that last statement down and pick that against your current church experience, then you have to ask yourself a couple of questions if it's not meshing. The whole process seeks to produce that. So every time you hear the word of the Lord, every time you sit in conferences or seminar, it is seeking to produce that objective. It's a lifelong journey, <laughs> interfacing with, fully imbibing, living from, and reflexively applying the variegated, the multifaceted, the kaleidoscopic freedoms that we've been given by virtue of adoption. That's very important. Listen to me now. Now, just a few closing comments on this succinct look at this word. The word huyefisia, this uh, uh, Roman concept that Paul introduces us to, was never, used, was, was, was never used among the Roman elites as a mechanism to satisfy their hormonal urge or baby fever. In other words, this was not something that you do because you wanted a child. You need to understand how deliberate this practice was. This was not an ad hoc, casual kind of thing. In the same way, God is not engaged in some kind of casual, ad hoc, I'll just save anybody. Anything that happens goes, you know? No, this is like a very deliberate pursuit of a successor. So what looks like an ordinary evangelistic exercise and what may appear to be a somewhat casual uh, ordinary, everyday kind of the gospel coming to you, that is a deliberate effort by God to bring you into his family. Because adoption was never used among the Roman elites as a mechanism to satisfy your hormonal urge and baby fever. You know, you, you're feeling broody. I want babies. I just want to have babies. So let me go and get me a child and adopt one. That's what the other people as common citizens would use. But once you're living up there as an emperor, as a Caesar, then you only activate this particular dynamic when you have some serious issues you want to address in years to come or right there in front of you. It was never used as a mechanism to satisfy your hormonal urge or baby fever. It was never deployed to satisfy some petty maternal or paternal curiosity or instinct. Well, let me check whether I have uh, um, baby baby making material. Let me check to see whether I can, whether I have mummy material inside of me or daddy material. So, you know, I really feel as though I could be a real good daddy. You know, I could be a real good mummy. So, so let me adopt a child just to give expression to my maternal instinct and my paternal instinct. This is not, it doesn't operate in those petty areas. This was, and write this down, here at the is a watershed principle within the unfolding story of redemption. A watershed, meaning that this is a game changer. And it is not just a casual concept. When we say watershed, we're talking about brand new tributaries being opening up, brand new pathways being, up, being opened up. This is like the beginning of a new thing. It's like opening up a brand new movement, new, new, new momentum. This is a watershed principle within the unfolding story of redemption. Because you can be saved, but you have not yet fully explored the vast terrain of adoption and sonship. And so this is Heliothesia. This was a watershed principle within the unfolding story of redemption. The reason why we are looking at these principles and we're expanding on it talking about it is because so much of what passes for Christianity it is so skewed. People are being manipulated by, by pseudo apostles. They are being controlled. I am getting these stories day after day after day, and my heart bleeds that hapless believers 
are being taken advantage of by some individuals who suddenly believe that they were given the authorization to tell people who has a call and who doesn't. Who They, they are destroying families and messing up the body of Christ. And I cannot blame these false apostles alone. I have to blame the company of believers who are blindly walking down this path and not subscribing to the broader principles of the kingdom that says, listen, you have power, you have authority, you have insight, you can hear the voice of God. Don't submit yourself to this kind of nonsense. Okay, <laughs> now let's get to contextualizing the metaphor, the, the, the adoption metaphor. Let's talk about this right now. So we got that first part done, that whole issue of <laughs> somewhat of a succinct version of these issues of adoption. Let's let's quickly look at the at the adoption metaphor. And this is what I'm going to say. The adoption metaphor was introduced to us by Paul. I said that earlier. I'm seeing it again. Paul introduced us to this adoption metaphor. As a Roman citizen, he used his knowledge of Roman culture to deconstruct a horizontal practice, meaning it was done by everybody, whether it was the small man or the big man, but among the big men, they had a different concept, but Paul utilized that concept. But Paul basically introduced us to something that was deep inside of the Roman culture. And this was designed to deconstruct a horizontal practice to give us an understanding of a profound vertical reality. Vertical meaning that this is not just between you and I. So every time you see adoption, please don't, don't narrow down adoption to your vertical understanding of adoption. Don't narrow it down to, well, you could go to, to, to some place in Vietnam and, and just adopt a baby or go to Ukraine and adopt a baby. Do not reduce it to that level. Paul went after the highest possible example to deconstruct that horizontal picture in order to give us a very profound vertical reality. This is not just a simple little issue. Now, there are four scriptures where Paul used that Paul used to employ the adoption terminology. Today I will look at three of them and leave the fourth one for another time because the fourth one is way too expansive. It cannot be done in once. It cannot be just thrown in here as part of this particular presentation. There are four scriptures that Paul used to employ the adoption terminology. Let's look at these four. First one. The first one is Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> And I'm quoting the New King James here. <laughs> and listen to this. Let's see some of the embedded realities inside of this practice. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6, the New King James, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Observe the language there. Look at verse 5. Having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, adopt, we were adopted as sons by Jesus to himself. This has very little to do with status and image, and I am all this now, and I'm doing all that stuff. This God has an objective. This God, he, he has adopted us. He has adopted us as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. I want to underline that part there, where that word, who your physia, is introduced as having predestined us to the adoption of sons. I want to read this scripture again because I want to pull just a few principles that we could understand where Paul is going. Blessed be the God and Father <laughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself. That's That to me, you know, there are some scriptures you just need to read it again and again because it has so much embedded inside of there. Sometimes you don't even want to deconstruct it. You just want to read it and allow 
the reading of the word to kind of wash over your soul and give you a sense of, ah, ah. It almost refreshes you in the inside. And scriptures like these do that. Now let's put a couple of principles out. Principle number one, verse four, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before the foundation of the world. I want you to take note of that. How long ago he did this? He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation. Now, I want, you to, I want to get this word right, because um, if you get a copy of Charles' book, there's a part in Charles' book that he makes a distinction between creation and foundation. But um, I'm using this word here. This word foundation is really not the word that is normally used for foundation. The word that is used throughout the New Testament for foundation, meaning like the, the platform upon which other things are built. The word that's normally used is the word thimilios. That's the word that's normally used for foundation. Right here, Paul uses an entirely different word. This is not, when he says before the foundation, he's not describing before the underpinnings of the earth has been constructed upon which everything is then built. That's not the term. The word that he's using here is the word katabelo. Katabelo. Now, this word katabelo means to fall away or to be put in a lower position. I want you to realize what Paul is after here. He chose us in him, paraphrase, before the falling away or before we collapsed to a lower position. In other words, this verse really should be read. Given the word that Paul used there, catabello, this verse really should say that he chose us in him before the falling out of the world. Put in another way, before man fell. Before man fell, before there was sin, before there was corruption, he chose us in him before the falling away. Now, listen to me, listen to me. The entire fall, what you know in Genesis, the entire fall was a, was a falling away in our minds, in our spirits, in our inner consciousness, to a false reality of God and a false reality of ourselves. A false reality. Now, you understand back in Genesis that <laughs> the moment uh, man ate of that forbidden fruit, they suddenly began to hide themselves. Now, what would cause them to hide themselves? This is the same garden that they were in. We all know that they were still, the word used in the, in the, in the Hebrews, the word gan, and it describes a specific place. They were still in the garden. <laughs> but now they were hiding themselves from the same God that they interfaced with every day in the cool of the day. What made them hide themselves? Clearly, the moment they ate of the fruit, they, they no longer saw this same God that they could interact with, interface with in the cool of the day. They suddenly had a different picture of this God, and that new image of this God led to them hiding themselves, covering themselves. The point is, the entire fall was a falling away in our mindsets, in our spirits, in our inner consciousness to a false reality of God and a false reality of ourselves. This, this, this is not just sin as we describe it. The way we always kind of, well, man, become immoral and unclean. And, no, it has other stuff going on here. The entire fall was a falling away in our mindsets, in our spirits, in our inner consciousness to a false reality of God. And today, while most of us are still saved, we are still living with that false reality of God. We are still living with a false reality of ourselves. That's the reason why we are still held captive by networks and leaders and, and, and bullies and narcissists who's manipulating the process inside of us because somehow we still have this false sight of God and a false sight of ourselves. That's how we see church the way church is. We still see leaders the way leaders are. And we have this skewed understanding of the whole dynamic of God because it is impossible for you to have a false sight of God and have a correct sight of everything else thereafter. It don't work like that. How we know that? There was one day Jesus gave this parable of um, a man who was given talents. And he, one of the guys took the talent and he dug a hole and put the talents in the ground. The guy who put the talent in the ground 
when Jesus came to get an assessment, this is what the guy said, I know you to be. I know you to be. The starting point of that man's bad action was a false and a distorted perception of God. I know you to be. He started wrong with his sight of God and everything else thereafter went downhill. You see, the fall, the entire fall, was a falling away into our, in our minds, in our spirits and our inner consciousness to a false reality of God and ourselves. Like Eve, we are all deceived into believing a lie about God and about ourselves. A devil came and he said, I mean, you really think that, 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 that God, you really think that God, this, this and whatever else? Like Eve, so much of the faith is living in a world of delusion and deception, believing a lie about God and believing a lie about ourselves. At the core of this adoption process is the realignment of those two realities in Long before God chose us in him before the fall. Now listen to me, listen to me. Adoption was never an afterthought. It was a divine forethought. If God did this before the falling away, please don't think that God sat down after Adam and Eve ate this forbidden fruit, scratch his head and say, okay, let me see what I would do to fix this problem we have here. God had this thing in place before the fall, before man collapsed into sin. Listen, adoption was never an afterthought. <laughs> it was always a divine forethought. Listen to me, listen to me. It predates the devil. It predates sin. It predates the fall. And that's the point that Ephesians is saying. Long before man fell, before the King James basically says, before the foundations. And he uses a different word altogether. This, this thing of adoption predates the devil, predates sin, predates the fall. Now let's see further. It reacquaints us. If this thing predates the devil, it predates sin, it predates the fall, what adoption seeks to do is to reacquaint us with our blameless innocence, where we were always found in Christ long before we were ever lost in Adam. You see, that there is an explosive concept that requires that you write that down and put sealer next to that. What adoption seeks to do is to reacquaint us. Remember I said that the fall caused us to have the skewed perspective of God and ourselves. <laughs> like Eve, we walked away with this deluded perception of God and this deluded perception of ourselves, and we still live there. We still see him badly. We still see one another badly. We still see ourselves badly. And that is the reason for all this division, this polarization, this fighting one another, this jockeying for power and all that madness. <laughs> all that madness. And what Paul is saying in Ephesians that, listen, God adopted us in Christ to himself long before the foundation of the earth. And what God is after the objective of adoption is to reacquaint us with our blameless innocence. Reacquaint us with a state that we always had in God, where we were always found in Christ long before we were ever lost in Adam. Now, you have to understand the language of the Bible, eh? because listen, when we talk about lost, you can only lose something that you once owned. You can't lose something that you never owned before. We were always in Christ. We were always in God. He has always been our address, you know. And for some strange reason, we have developed all of these theories and philosophies. What God wants to do is to bring us back to bring it, bring us back home. Bring us back home. The objective of adoption is to reacquaint us with our blameless innocence, our blameless innocence, where we were always found in Christ. And in doing so, is to erase that deluded distortion smoke in our eye reality where we see god badly we see one another badly and with that there's a cascading sense of insanity because our sight is already deluded listen to me further in that regard listen to me adoption therefore is a powerful re reverse engineering exercise remember god did this before the fall Adoption is a powerful reverse engineering exercise that comes with embedded authority over all the realities that it predates. 
Now that 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 I wrote that there, but that has so much embedded inside of it. Because whatever God did, when he sent his son, and we're going to get to that shortly, when God sent his son, he is after something of enormous capability. Adoption is more than you walking to the front of a church and saying, well, hallelujah, I'm rehearsing these three spiritual laws. Adoption is powerful reverse engineering. And it comes with embedded authority over all the realities it predates. What are those realities? The devil, sin, and the fall. It has enough power inside of that process of adoption to literally put you above those issues that we are constantly stumbling at. The devil, the sin, and the fall. Long before, long before the foundation, long before the fall, this stuff was put in place. You all understand me? If you can say yes, say yes. Principle number two. The second scripture. We're doing this really fast because I want to get some feedback still. <laughs> the second scripture. We said we're looking at things that Paul said and how Paul kind of deconstructed this, this, um, this metaphor. Romans chapter 9. I'm quoting the, the New Living Translation. <laughs> Romans 9. It says, with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. I want you to read the language here. I read this today and I and I started to cry because um, I was talking to a pastor a couple of days ago and um, he came by and we were sitting and talking and he began to tell me about some stuff, man, that just breaks my heart because it, it, it really, really got me angry because so many well-intended believers have found themselves <laughs> in places of, of, of such abuse, pain, assault, and injury. I'm hearing about leaders who are almost canceling people's call and tell pastors they're not qualified to hear the voice of God and not qualified to speak in their own churches, and they have to be subjected to one leader speaking to all of these churches in the name of maintaining some degree of governmental order. It is madness out there, you know, madness out there. Listen to Romans 9, and I want you to pick up one very important part of Paul's heart and Paul's disposition. Here, let me read it again. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenant with them and gave them his law. He gave them a privilege the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, and one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Now, now what struck me is, is, is what I describe as the heart of Paul, a real, sincere longing to bring people into purpose, a sincere longing to bring people into the fullness of their identity and call. And listen to the cry. I'm going to read it again. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed and cut off from Christ if that would save them. Now, that, that is serious conversation. Huh? That is when, when, a, when a guy could begin to talk to God like that, those are not casual words that a, a simple pastor is casting up before God in a kind of willy-nilly manner. This guy is saying, if only I could die without God to give my Jewish brothers their privileged space before him, I will do it. Like, like Moses saying, cut me off and and save your people. Those are serious words. Normal men don't say that. 
for you to pray like that for a people, you really have had to have a sight of God in an unprecedented manner. I would rather be cursed. I'd rather be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Now, here's my point. Note the posture of a genuine apostolic heart. <laughs> if you want to know what a real apostle is, forget all the revelation. Genuine apostle has nothing to do with revelation. It has nothing to do with revelation. It has nothing to do with syntax and, and, and understanding subtext and deconstructing scriptures and giving you all of these nice philosophical ideas. Note the posture of a genuine apostolic heart. And if you are here and you are you are one of those running behind some apostolic figure because they have a couple flashy words to communicate, please grow up. This is this is 2023. We are not that deluded anymore. This is the posture of a genuine apostolic heart. Listen to Paul. I prefer that I be cut off and they be saved. Listen, today's pseudo-apostle will cut you off to protect themselves. They'll cut you off to protect their organization. Paul said, I would gladly surrender myself to be cut off to bring people into strength, to bring them into identity, to bring them into purpose. I would gladly suffer loss Tell me which apostle is prepared to do that. Any apostle that you know that's willing to live like that, he's worthy of your, of your commitment. I would rather suffer loss. Now hear me, beware of any apostle who reduces you to an expendable. In other words, we can gladly get rid of you. We can gladly. In other words, you cross me, I will cut your throat. You beware of any apostle who reduces you to an expendable who seeks to silence you, cancel your call while posturing as infallible and flawless because they have a few hapless sycophants drunk on their Kool-Aid. Beware of any apostle who does not hold this as a standard. I would gladly cut myself off to bring you into life. Too many apostles are too quick at cutting people off shutting their ministries down and canceling their call because it caters to their sense of super importance. Paul said, my position as an apostle, I would, sp I would leave the 90 and nine and go after one. I would suffer pain to bring others into purpose. I would suffer loss to bring others into their calling in God. Now we have to understand too, uh, Paul is speaking into a context where uh, an entire nation with enormous pedigree and capability, they're struggling to find their footing. He's talking about Israel. And Paul's position is, oh God, if only they know who they are. If they only could understand who they are in God, what Christ and what God has done for them. But they are blind in their little religious, little nonsense. But I am willing to be cut off if necessary to bring them into a place of sight clarity. That, to me, is explosive apostolic credentials. Right there. Forget all this stuff about having the ability, the ability to design an architecture. and Forget all that stuff about global footprint and running around the earth. This has nothing to do with running around the world and logging frequent flyer miles in your car and building, building stuff in this nation. And No, Paul said, the heart of an apostle from this area right here, this has nothing to do with your global reach. It has nothing to do with the bigness of your organization. It has nothing to do with how much books you've written. It is how much are you prepared to suffer for the strength of others? Because that's the Christ reality. That's the Christ reality. That's what, that's what Philippians called the kenosis. He reduced himself to bring others into life. He became poor so others would become rich. You show me another man who's willing to do that. And I'm saying, run and follow that man. Listen to me. <laughs> Let's get to the other part that Paul is after. <laughs> this is the New American Standard version here of that same scripture. Let me quote this from the New American Standard. Who are Israelites to whom belongs, he's talking about the Israelites, to whom belong the adoption of sons. He's talking about his cry for the Israelites to whom belong the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law and the temple services <laughs> and the promises uh, whose, are, whose, whose, whose are the fathers and from whom 
is the Christ according to the flesh. That's verses four and five, the New American Standard. Now, Paul's grief is triggered by the fact that the adopted of God is blind, unaware, drifting, and lost. That's where the cry of Paul is. These are the adopted of God. Are they aware of who they are? The adopted of God, but they seem unaware of who they are. Israel is God's corporate son. And with that responsibility comes an enormous amount of privileges and benefits. Observe how that scripture is constructed. As a corporate son, there's enormous privileges and responsibility. Note, they are the adopted, the adoption of sons. They have the glory. They have the covenant. They've been given laws. They have the right to worship at the temple. They've been given promises. And on top of that, from whom is the Christ? So all of that, all of that happens to be available to them, but they are still lost in their little Judaism and they're practicing their little religion. Does that sound very much like church today? All of this enormous responsibility, the corporate son lost in little rituals and Sunday activities and rituals, etc. empty activities while all this stuff is going on. All this stuff is theirs. And that's why Paul <coughs> introduces the concept of adoption. You are the adopted of God. You are not just a, another, another Jewish bunch of people going through rituals. You are the adopted of God. And as the adopted of God, all this stuff is yours. Point B. Now, this is what it looks like. In describing Israel, there's this grand prophetic promise. And Paul said that, that, that they have the prophetic record. That Israel, the adopted of God, they are the custodians of the prophetic heritage. But between the prophetic heritage, they also happen to be the womb that will bring about the total fulfillment of everything that God wants. So they have the prophetic record, but out of them will come the Christ. And Paul is using serious language that here you are. You, are, you think that you are just an average believer. You're just the average church down, downtown Brooklyn, maybe 15 people clapping their hands, and you have no idea that all this stuff is you. This stuff is you, that you are the custodian of the prophetic promise, <clears throat> but you are equally the womb that will bring forth the absolute finality of all this objective. And between there is you. The corporate son lives between those two realities. Now, you look at that and you have to understand that the thing that will trigger your understanding of your importance and your call and your role and your function is just, listen, you are the adopted of God. You have been given the covenant. You have been given the promises. You, from you, the womb, from your own womb will come forth this ultimate objective. Listen, the corporate son is the axis that holds these two realities in agreement and balance. Sonship is not just a casual thing. You stand as a corporate son. You are basically holding the promises and the fulfillment, and you are holding that stuff in your loins. I hope that you can understand this. But we are not some arbitrary bunch of people who just living to say, well, I'm a son, and so I want to get a blessing. I'm a son. I deserve to get a healing. I'm a son. No, I'm a son because, listen, I have to manage this process. The corporate son is the axis that holds these two realities in agreement and in balance. The promises of God and the fulfillment of divine objectives. The promises of God and the fulfillment of divine objectives. Listen, the corporate sun is the animated energy that glues these two dynamics in unconflicting solidarity. In other words, the, the, the promises should never conflict with the fulfillment. <coughs> the promises of God should never be perceived as, well, I am getting blessed and those promises are designed to make me strong and make me powerful. No, the promises are connected to you bringing forth the ultimate fulfillment of God's eternal intents. The corporate sun is the animated energy that glues these two dynamics in unconflicting solidarity. I put unconflicting in inverted commas because it's not a real word. It's not a real word. The point is they should not be colliding and clashing with one another. <clears throat> that, that you being a corporate son, you manage these two, these two dynamics, the promises of God and the fulfillment of his objectives. 
you find a church or a body of people in the earth who interact with the promises of God, not just as some little tickle, you know, some little religious tickling that make me feel all good in the inside. No, those things are there for God to push his objectives to a place of finality and realization. Now, Paul's pain, <laughs> Paul's pain was that the was that Israel stands in that place of power, but they are unaware and not deliberately participating. Unaware and not deliberately participating. You're a son. All this stuff is yours. You're a son. The promises are yours. The laws are yours. The covenant is yours. The right to worship God, the freedom to stand before him and confront him with confidence, bold confidence. Yours also is the promises given to the fathers and from your womb will come forth the absolute fulfillment of everything that God has been after over the ages. And Paul's concern is good heavens. These people are lost in their Sunday morning rituals, singing their little ditties and doing their little, their little charismatic uh, gymnastics and they just seem ill aware. You have all this stuff, all this mission, all this mandate, all this responsibility, but you are lost in a little religious bubble. And that's exactly who the Jews were. And Paul says, if only you could come aware, you could become aware and sensitized to the fact that you are the adopted of God. You're not just a bunch of Jews. You are the adopted of God. You stand between these two dynamic poles and you are the manager of that dynamic process. Listen to me. Their religious rituals fool them into believing that they are participators in the process. Their Sunday morning exercises, they are convinced like, listen, we are the hot number in town, you know. Because we gather every Sunday morning and we, not every Sunday morning in, the, in their context, we gather every Sabbath day and we go through the rituals of Judaism. They were convinced that they were the hottest number in town, you know. It's amazing what delusion does to people. Eh? <laughs> amazing what delusion does. In all of their little ritual, they miss the point. Listen to me, and I might end on this slide because I want to get some conversations. Now, the adopted son, listen, the adopted son is the womb that conceives the fulfillment and the full embodiment of God's plan, but they are ill aware of it. You go back to what Paul was saying. He said, from them comes forth Christ in the flesh. The adopted son is the womb that conceives the fulfillment and the full embodiment of God's plan. They are, not they are not participating in this massive story because of their ignorance. <coughs> and this is the part that really struck me in my looking at this. Huh? Despite their ignorance, they, they, in a way, despite their ignorance, their status as sons remain unchallenged. Despite their ignorance. Their ignorance, their ignorance does not interrupt delay or terminate the intent. But their knowledge and, de and deference could accelerate and embellish the process. In other words, Christ still came through a Jewish womb. He still came despite their ignorance, despite their rejection. And this I found to be explosive in my mind. Despite their ignorance, their status as sons, as a corporate son, as the adopted remains unchallenged. Their ignorance never interrupted, never delayed. Christ came on time. The Bible speaks of him in the fullness of time. He was not delayed, not even by a second. It did not terminate the intents of God. But if we have to pull that into our current understanding, if we have knowledge, if we are deferring, and if we give ourselves to it, could you imagine how much we could do in our day of understanding? Sonship, listen, sonship transcends understanding though we should understand it transcends engagement though we should engage it transcends doings though we should commit ourselves to doing the will of god these people did nothing but yet still so much was done through them even though they shut it down they compromised it the point you have to get is that listen there are dimensions to sonship that will just work effortlessly but god wants you to engage you see like the prodigal the adopted does not need to do anything but be a son to appeal to and attract the, faith, the father's redemptive care. There's nothing you have to do. That's what the story of grace says. 
but in some areas, grace is abused. Like the prodigal, the adopted does not need to do anything but be a son. Paul says these are the adopted of God. If only they know who they are, they won't try to be a bunch of this and that and whatever. Just be a son. Just be a son. The adopted of God. And it attracts the, redempt the, redempt the redemptive care. That's important. Now, this is the third scripture. <clears throat> Can I do this? Or I'm going to stop right there. Let me stop right there. We have about 25 minutes. I'm going to get to the scripture maybe next week. So uh, this is where we're going to get into the whole issue of you becoming God's address. We'll talk about that another time. So <coughs> let me get some. Um, we have about 25 minutes before we uh, turn this meeting back over to Kelvin. So let's get some interaction before we say goodnight to you wherever you are. Sorry for coughing in your ear all evening, but um, I trust you understand. Who will be first? Kelvin, I don't see anyone. <coughs> yeah, Charles. <I'll> <coughs> yeah, Charles, your hand is up. Now, interestingly, you'd be surprised why my hand is up. My hand is up because I've got this feeling that you should finish that little part you've left out. This I mean, you've been, away, you've been away a while. <laughs> We'd rather just get this thing on the road. Because okay. the window of time that's left, I don't know what everybody else thinks, but that's really where I'm sitting at. Well, I, well, I think, that's, that's I'm sure, mean. Charles, maybe Kelvin, I'm sure Kelvin would say that you speak on behalf of all of us. Kelvin? Yeah, let's go for <laughs> it. Too close, man. Come on. Thank you, Charles. Please, yeah. please, 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 please let him go. Let him do it. Okay. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. in the same room, man. Okay. <laughs> Okay, rolling, we, said brother. Again, Come on. we said that there are four scriptures and we're going to leave one out for another time. This is the third area where Paul gets into this concept and he begin to lay out this whole concept of adoption. Third scripture. And this is Romans 8, <laughs> 14 to 17. I'm quoting the New Living Translation. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. That's the New Living Translation. If you use King James or <laughs> or one of those other translations, it should say that you are sons of God. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. So you have, so you have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you have received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba Father, for His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Now, that is such a marvelous <laughs> set of scriptures there. We are led, meaning that you, you surrender the steerage of your life to him. That qualifies you to be a son. So you have not received a spirit. And that, that word receive is a word that, that basically says that it's been handed to you from a higher position. It's been handed to you. You have not been handed from a higher position a spirit that makes you fear, fear, fearful a fearful slave. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you into his own family. Now you, are, now you call him Abba Father. Let's get a couple of things inside of there. A couple of things. Now, the incarnation. <clears throat> the incarnation is what I would describe as the invisible, eternal God manifesting himself in visible form. So when, 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 when he was named Emmanuel and all this stuff, that is what the incarnation, the incarnation is the invisible, eternal God manifesting himself in visible form. That incarnation, listen to me, because you realize that Paul is making a very important point here. And I'm connecting that adoption process and I'm taking it right back to the incarnation exercise. The incarnation, that invisible, eternal God manifesting himself in visible form was a homing summons for the adopted of God. Let me go back and read that scripture. It's a homing summons. When I say homing, homing is almost like something that calls you. So you have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own, as his own children. Now you call him our Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. When Jesus stepped into the arena of humanity, and when the, when the incarnation touched down in this dimension, when the incarnation occurred, that invisible eternal God, 
he was not just stepping into the earth. The more you read it from this angle, you realize that the Bible, the word of God, is a whole new book. The incarnation is not a Christmas story. This was like a homing summons that you have this stuff inside of you, you gravitate towards it. And that is why it's like, well, he came to his own. His own did not respond to this, but as many as received him, he gives them the right to be a son because the son comes into the earth. And this is not just a son, this is God stepping into the arena of life. And that whole experience is a homing summons. It speaks to the deep dimensions of God inside of you. That ordained innocence that you had long before you were found in Adam, that stuff is responding to something that is in Christ. And he calls it, he summons you forward. And that to me is incredible. You see, adoption is a watershed moment within the unfolding story of redemption. I said that earlier, but I have to say it again. It is a watershed. It changes the course of your life. Adoption is the redeemed's acknowledgement that they are God's address. He resides in us, and we become the most tangible display of his eternal thoughts and his eternal attributes. That's what this thing is, that, that, that the Spirit of God, you have received his own spirit of adoption, that you become his address. You are God's zip code. Adoption is the redeems acknowledgement that they are God's address. God lives here. He lives inside of me. And just as Jesus walked into the earth as God in the flesh, I am now his temple. The word for temple is the very word that means skin, skin. Every time you see the word temple in the Greek language, the very word for temple means skin. God lives not in a building down the street. He lives in my skin. He occupies my dwelling. I am his zip code. Adoption begins by me coming into that understanding. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave, but you've received the very spirit spirit of adoption that makes you cry, Abba, Father. That thing basically says that God lives in you. And that's the mystery that Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Adoption fulfills or brings into a place of absolute clarity that enormous mystery. Christ lives in my skin. That makes me more than just an arbitrary little black boy from the Caribbean. I am more than that. Don't mess with me, bro. And I will not mess with you because I do not perceive you in the flesh. And you should not perceive me in the flesh either. Because I am not some little Mickey Mouse from Trinidad. Neither are you, no matter where you come from. Adoption is the redeems acknowledgement. I I'm aware, I come into this realization, the redeems acknowledgement that they are God's address. He resides in us and we become the most tangible display of his eternal thoughts and his eternal attributes. Everything that Jesus did by the, with, with the incarnation, by adoption, I become. And that's an important point. What Jesus was or who he is by virtue of the incarnation, I become by virtue of adoption. Adoption, he lives in me. And I become living in me does not mean, well, okay, well, um, he basically occupies some organ in my being. No, he expresses himself. Just as I live in this skin called a body, God lives in this skin called a temple. And I express myself in a certain way in order to demonstrate his eternal thoughts, <laughs> his eternal attributes. And that's the reality of adoption. Now, the final point on this particular, this particular issue is important. Listen to this. This is, uh, most of you must have read, this is a literature classic, <laughs> Harper Lee, To Kill a Mockingbird. This is something that Harper Lee wrote in her book, To Kill a Mockingbird. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk about in it. Now, that's an important, simple point. That's not the Bible. That's literature. That's Harper Lee. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view 
and could you climb into a skin and walk about in it? How does this apply to what Jesus is saying to us? Go back and see what Jesus said. How Paul described this whole issue of adoption. Listen, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive this, the adoption of sons. This, this whole adoption exercise didn't happen in some kind of vacuum. The point I want you to get is this. Jesus is the patterned son whose example defines our behavior and our attitude. And that, that, that ought to speak volume to you. I gave you a while ago the model apostolic behavior in Paul. Now here is the model apostolic behavior in Christ. This is the model apostolic behavior. Note that Jesus exists in an environment that is not dissimilar to ours. When he came, he didn't step into a vacuum. Jesus exists in an environment that is not dissimilar. It is not alien or strange to ours. Note, born of a woman, born of a woman, born under the law, born under the law, talking about the system under which he lived, to redeem those who are under the law. Born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Something about that speaks to, it speaks volumes to me. Born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. You know, that that is that says something to me. And this is what it says. Huh? This puts Jesus in a position of familiarity, in a position of understanding, and a position of sensitivity. Once you understand that in the mix of in the midst of exp exploiting and pushing your, your adoption status, it is not this image that you get that I am so high and mighty and I'm so grand, seated in heavenly places and all these lowly little Christians down there and these lowly little unsaved believers. No, this is not this weird swagger that we develop by virtue of having a little two cents of understanding. This puts, he was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. I read that today and I think that thing just came alive in my heart. He came under the law. The point is, Harperly says, you really do not know how to relate to some how to relate to someone until you walk in their shoes. Anymore. The point is, I want you to get this. This puts Jesus in a position of familiarity. He was born in the same circumstances like yours. He can relate to your situation. Born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. We think that Jesus came outside the law to redeem those who are in the law. You know, he came in a place of total purity. Jesus walked about in a bubble that he really was safeguarded from all the contaminations of this life. And so he is totally unfamiliar with your madness. This is the point. Most leaders work over time to create a world that is totally superior and untethered from those that they are leading. They work over time. The leaders will do everything possible just to break the basic pattern of Jesus. He came under the law to redeem those who were under the law. The average preacher, if you have a church in the ghetto, you want to live in a mansion. Everything that you do <laughs> must communicate a sense that I am not like you, the people I'm leading. You see, from that place of remoteness, you see, if you're a leader, and this is what makes networks become so messed up and apostles so mad and crazy because they live by that same mad virtue. You do not know someone. Don't judge another person. Don't condemn another person until you could walk in their shoes. You could put on their skin. Jesus understands that philosophy. How many leaders understand it? You see, from that place of remoteness, where you are constantly engineering an existence to Pull yourself away from your people from that place of remoteness and deluded superiority. You will have insensitivity, manipulation, punishment, and punitive behavior and judgment. That's because you just don't understand it. Because you don't live where John down the street lives. And so you live in your paneled apostolic house and you have this enormous insight and you just cannot understand how John is a member of your church for 10 years, but John is struggling because you just don't know where John lives. You get up on a Sunday morning and you preach wonderful messages, 
which is nothing more than chateau generals living in your panel house, eating your steaks, but giving instructions to the men out in the battlefield that bears no relationship to their situation that is alien to yours. See, the issue is sonship does not occur in a bubble. It occurs in an environment of proximity up close. Jesus is the pattern. And what is his pattern? He lives in a world of familiarity, a world of understanding, a world of sensitivity. The reason why he could tell even people caught in the worst situation, woman, I have nothing against you. Go and sin no more. You do that by the average preacher in 2023. They want to cut your neck off. They want to destroy you because they have no understanding of the Christ reality. From that place of remoteness and deluded superiority, living in your paneled house of importance in that place of superiority, completely alien to the Harperly understanding, you become insensitive. You become manipulative. You become punitive and judgmental. That is not the order of God in the earth. I'm going to stop right there. We need to stop. We're going to pick up this next time. <laughs> I think that's a good place to stop. Charles, is okay if I stop here now? <laughs> we'll stop right there. I'm and, good um, with that, and I'm glad I, I, I insisted. <laughs> <laughs> all good, man. All good. <laughs> good, good, good. Guys, we have about 10 minutes. Let's get some feedback. Let's get some interaction. I'm going to leave this Abba Father part for next week. And um, we still have to get into the, the prodigal, looking at the heart of the father. We'll get into that next week. Okay, I'm going to close my screen and uh, let me get some interaction. I'm going to leave that screen right there then. Uh, Kelvin, you have to direct traffic and let me know who's um, who wants to make a comment. <laughs> okay, please signify by holding your hand up, uh, the icon there under reactions that'll help us to know you want, want to speak or have a comment on what was delivered here today, this presentation. <laughs> All right, anyone? <coughs> All right, David, I see okay. you. David yeah. Castro. Yeah, thank you, Kelvin. Um, Andy, great to hear you, brother. I'm so thankful that Charles spoke up and that you were able to continue because you were on, on a powerful role here. Uh, my comment is this. What you shared with us today in the in the early part was that this word adoption that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use, Paul was using it because he knew that that word was in the context of government. It was in the context of governmental leaders, emperors, who could not have children and they would adopt so the legacy would continue so that the order of the government would continue uh to me that is a powerful powerful uh principle and revelation because that's what god is god is a government he's not religion so god doesn't just want us to be sons little children here a happy happy look no we've got to have an understanding that he has adopted us because he has a kingdom. He has a domain, a government that needs to have a, a continuation of the authority of the implementation of what that government is. Uh, so I, I get from what you have shared today that that's a powerful, powerful principle. I pray that others will see that because that's what makes this so right. different and applicable within the kingdom than within traditional religious Christianity. Thank you again. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. Good comment, David. Excellent comment. Excellent comment. <laughs> we have Henry Kamau. Henry Kamau. I've not heard your voice in a long time, Henry. What's happening down in Kenya, man? Oh, hi, Abby. Thanks very much. And that was a little, little deep presentation. Very grateful. Kenya is good, doing well, well, and I know we'll talk off of the Zoom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And thanks very much for reminding us that the core of adoption, the core of sonship, is actually God and the purposes of God. Right. And it reminds me of that, <laughs> just where you started, that that is the core. And this is where Jesus would say, 
that I only do what I see my father do. Mm. That means that Jesus came to set the example for us, that he came to represent God. And therefore, the sonship, because he says, when you have seen me, you have the seen the father. Right. I only do what I see my father do. And then he goes ahead in commissioning us, in telling us to breathe, because he started with that message of <laughs> change the way you think, change the way you perceive things. The kingdom is God, or God is here. I want to take you back to that kingdom where you actually where you, you, you started and where you were that before the creation, the foundation of the world. And Jesus even tells us, believe this, get into the kingdom, get where you are. And in, in, I think in John chapter 14, he says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the work that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this, he will also do because I go to the Father. So the core of this is about the Father. The core of this sonship is about representing God. That is why the work, the redemption, and actually it even started, even before he went to the cross, he set it for us. The moment he said, change the way you think, change your perception. So it's about how do we see? Have we believed that we are kingdom sons and the limitations have already been removed? Or are we still limiting ourselves and, and still limiting God's, I mean, the, the capability of God in us, that we are limiting him in what he wants to do in us as kingdom son. And this is what Jesus came to remove. In fact, I call it redemption, a recommissioning back. He redeemed us and recommissioning back to the purposes, to where we had fallen from. So thanks very much, Andy, for reminding us of that. Oh, Thank you. Excellent. 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 If, if at all I could leave... You know, one of those points that I made that makes so much sense to me, when we think about how, how Paul described it, that we were adopted in him before the foundation, and we saw the, the word that was used by Paul for foundation, meaning before the fall. And I said that adoption is like a reverse engineering process, that, that God is almost taking us back to that particular state and that disposition where we can live in that um, redeemed innocence. That is such an important point. I want to encourage you guys to kind of um, go back. If if um, if you want me to send the notes of today, I could send these notes out that you could um, follow the presentation again on YouTube and keep these notes close to you. I would send Kelvin these notes that you would be able to get a hold of it and um, follow it uh, and, and take notes and build on it, share it, preach it. I don't care. This has no copyright laws on these concepts. Let's make it available. All right, I can do that for you. Excellent. Anybody else? I don't see anyone with hands up, yeah. Andy. Uh, we do have uh, a guest. Uh, Levita Williams uh, uh, has a guest here that yes. uh, we'd like for her to uh, acknowledge. We're happy to have her with us. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Kelvin. I'm mm -hmm. so excited that Judy Andrews was here to hear what Anderson has taught today, so tremendous. Uh, Judy, do you wanna come up and just greet everyone? Judy yes. is a, a wonderful, wonderful woman of God who has uh, been by my side for uh, probably the last 12 or 14 years or so. And uh, we do life together, we do ministry together on several levels. And uh, I just invited her yesterday and I was so glad to see her sign on. Judy, go right ahead. Yes, hello. Greetings to everyone. I have truly enjoyed what I heard. And I too would like the notes. I really would like to be able to hear it over and over. It uh, was so different from, from, from what I've been taught. I love the definition of words. And so I thank you, uh, Brother Williams, for um, Apostle Williams, for um bringing this word and bringing the definitions to us. And I have truly enjoyed these last two hours. Looking forward to uh, next week. Thank you so really, much. Really good to have you. And um, we, you can, in fact, listen to this over and over. And Kelvin will tell you exactly where you can listen to it. We have a YouTube channel. You can go and get this. This will be available by about this evening. And um, if you're not on the mailing list, I'm sure that we can um, get the notes to Levita and she will get it to you. Really Thank good you. to have you here. I trust you felt really comfortable and you're cool. 
Nobody walked on your toes. I try to be a real nice boy. And um, <laughs> I try not to offend anybody. I really try hard to be a nice, gentle soul. So um, bless you. <laughs> bless you. Thank you. Thank you also. Okay. Hi, Kevin. It's, it's, it's ball in your court now, Kevin. There All were a right. couple of notes, things written. I don't know if that, those things were written for us to read. I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, I think we had the announcement for the Nations Builders. Uh, Frederick oh, left okay. the link there. Thank you for that. And then also um, Charles and Susan O'Peel's book on Unmasking Mammon okay, is good. on there as well in the chat. So, um, Judy, uh, again, thank you for coming on with us. Um, you're from Chicago, so I knew we had to hear from you because that is the place of my birth as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Anyone <laughs> else? Uh, final comments before we go. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Cassidy really was impacted <laughs> and, and made comments in the chat there. Cass, always good to have you on, man, and and each of you. So we know it's getting late there in 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 Africa. So we want to bid you all farewell until next week. Be well, everyone. <laughs>